So today, this is a webinar about design thinking, and you will learn plenty of things to, um, to kickstart with uh, such a mindset. And uh, we have uh, so plenty of people coming from uh, different places. We have, uh, let me summarize, I think that's fun. We have people from uh, America, uh, Colombia, uh, Cameroon, Colombia, Belgium, Lebanon, Iraq, Indonesia, Kenya, Vietnam, Algeria, Ghana, uh, USA and Turkey, India, Tunisia. And, and uh, yes, that's a, a lot of people coming from different countries and English is the proper language for this one. So, just to introduce myself, I've been working in fact uh, 20 years in a high-tech high -tech startup in uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, as we say. And uh, so I, I grew in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in an ecosystem that was very much focused on the users. So uh, I, I started working in a high-tech startup and we were very, very much focused on getting things done for the users, for the customers, and it was the only things that counted. Day Thinking Academy, it's a, a network of um, uh, trainers, of uh, uh, practitioners who intend to do things uh, differently, to think differently, and to be uh, differently. So we can feel that nowadays we, this world requires uh, new leaders, uh, new uh, uh, professionals to uh, accelerate this uh, transformation, this human-centered transformation. So what are you going to learn today in this uh, short webinar? You are going to learn uh, design thinking, but to do what? What is the purpose of design thinking? After that, I will focus on uh, its mindset, the values, and the principles behind it. Then I will tell you something about the process and the different tools you can use along the process. And a few words at the end uh, for the academy. So, design thinking, in fact, it applies to uh, multiple domains as soon as it meets some uh, uh, criteria. So you can use it to design products that are more user-centered. And uh, later on, it came to services. So you can design services that are more user-centered. And more recently, in the last uh, 20 years, you can use it to design organization and to get them more user-centered. So when, when can you decide if yes or no, you can use such a mindset, such a method? We have a, a few criteria, six. The most important one is when the challenge requires to deeply understand the user. When you have such a challenge, it means that more likely you can use such a mindset, such a method. When you have a high level of uncertainty for the solution and the result, it's more likely something that is also applicable. If you know the solution or if a solution, you can find it analytically, just forget it. I mean, just test your solution and you will see if it works or not. Uh, now you have uh, also uh, when the challenge in, is in a complex environment, uh, it, it might be a good idea to use this method because this method is very, very good to um, work with um, uh, environment that are, uh, that, that are highly complex. You are going to do it with a team. Your team needs to be enthusiastic enough. So if it lasts one, two, three days, it's fine. But if your project lasts a few weeks, a few months, it's a lot of hard work. So you rather get a team very enthusiastic about the challenge. So when you look at um, uh, such a mindset, such a method, you can think about the tools and you're going to see a few of them uh, later today. But those tools, they are used in a methodology, in a practice, so practices, design thinking. And the principles behind it are really to bring value to users. We have those tools, those practices 
to bring value to users. And the team is going to rock with a certain culture. And this culture is about trust and empowerment. And, and beyond that, we have a mindset that is the most important, that's this user centricity. And from this user centricity, if you are user centric, all the rest is going to come by itself. Because if you want to be efficiently user centric, you would have to trust the others, your team. You would have to empower teams and people. And your principle that's really about bringing value to users. You are going to develop a method that is design thinking, and you're going to use some tools associated to this method. The higher you go, the less it is visible, but the more powerful is, it is. And the difficulty for a company adopting such a mindset is, to, is the cultural transformation. So to bring people to think about user centricity, that's the most difficult one. Tools, it's easy. You come to a training, you get them. So, let's start with a mindset. So the most difficult one. So, okay, we have a technology push and a microprocessors or memories. It's a very good example. We have a market pool. You have that on your mobile phone with the cameras and you have user experience. So to bring the best experience possible to the users. So the trick is, in fact, to meet the user needs. So that's market pool, latent or existing, huh? with an outstanding user experience using relevant technology breaks. But the most important is to meet the user needs. And that's the most important, and that's also the most difficult one. So if you look at uh, this uh, bottle, tomato ketchup, so on the left side, it was the, uh, the old design, and they have been redesigning the experience. So that's user experience. So the product itself stayed the same. It is still ketchup inside, but they changed the user experience of it. So now you don't need to hit the bottom to get the ketchup getting out. So you can keep in your fridge the bottle in this position. So only here the design, the, easy, the user experience has changed. Quite often, in fact, to meet the user needs, you don't need to change everything. Sometimes the, 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 what, what the user needs, that's very, very basic, like Wi-Fi in a cafe or in a restaurant. If I go to a cafe and a restaurant and there is no Wi-Fi and I need to work, I get out immediately. That's my basic need. That's all I need, basically, when I travel, when I'm remote. So the same. You go to a place to eat and you have to wait too long. It doesn't take me long for me to go and to say bye-bye. Yeah? So those needs are very basic and they are highly critical needs if they do not exist. Now, if you go a bit further, if you look at a uh, Uber, in fact, what they, what they thought of, it was to improve the user experience, but even more, they went far beyond the user experience. They have been reinventing completely the experience of a taxi, the taxi experience. And something very, very small, huh? but it makes a big difference. When you order uh, a vehicle, you know how long it's going to take for it to come, and you see the number of minutes. It's so common nowadays. Everybody knows it. Huh? but it was a huge difference when they started it. So they have been improving the, the, the user experience, but even more, they have been reinventing completely, in fact, the taxi uh, experience. So it has to be user-centered, very much. That's the only thing that counts in this method. And that's not even a method, that's a mindset, because everything 
falls under this mindset. So, uh, you know this guy? He was used to say that you have got to start with a customer experience and work back toward the technology, not the other way around. In fact, I almost agree with him. So I agree for ketchup, you need to start with a customer experience, yes, but you need to start from the need, from the user need. So for instance, saying it differently, when you look at uh, the ketchup bottle, in fact, the user's need is, I want to get my ketchup on my hamburger or on my French fries very easily. I don't want to spend time on it. It has to be like that, boom. So this need, leads to designing a different ketchup bottle. So usually to understand the needs of your users, in fact, you need to spend time. You need to spend money. And it's not easy, it's painful. Because to put yourself in someone else's shoes, it takes effort. So when a company wishes to go uh, into user-centered innovation. In fact, they need to become aware that it costs time and money. There is no way otherwise. So some do. So for instance, they, they squeeze uh, the observation phase. So they don't do any interviews with their users. And when you do so, you have a very, very low return on investment. So you can, but don't expect too much because you will not get that much. So gaining empathy with your customers, that's a core competency of your company. You cannot externalize that. You should not externalize this one. And so do the GAFAM. So I'm not aware that those companies, they pay all the companies to better understand their own users. They do everything themselves. So the quantitative part, so the data, but also the qualitative part. So understanding the emotions, the mindset of their users when they use their uh, tools, their products, their services. So don't forget, it's the core competency of your company. So the values of design thinking, I said it already, it is mainly about trust and empowerment. And trust and empowerment respect to a team. So the team, the design team is the one that is going to deliver the solution to some needs of users. So this team is self-organized, this team is user-centric, and this team is in continuous learning. It requires from management to trust this team, to empower this team, and that's not something easy. So that's the team that decides, for instance, when they move to the next phase, if the product or the service should be productized, and so on and so forth. So, there is one thing that is very, very important for a team to function well, the psychological safety. It's much more important than anything else. Because if you feel that if you fail, you are fired, it's not going to fly. In fact, you need to feel secured enough that if you screw up, you can always start again, iterate, and run and succeed. So that's very much about creating a team. In fact, choosing the team members. So the team casting is very, very important to have the very good people, the best people you have. You give them a lot of autonomy. You empower them and you say, I trust you. You can do it. Just go. And tell me once in a while how far you are. That's what it is. It has nothing to do with command and control. It has to do with empowerment. So it's obvious, but it's always good to repeat it. 
the emotional ambience, the atmosphere in this design team will lead to, 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 to with a good correlation factor to success or failure. So the better the atmosphere, the more successful the team will be. So the principles behind design thinking, that's mainly or only to bring value to the user. It's the only focus of the design team. Your only purpose is to bring value to the users of your organization. And for that, most of the time, you need a paradigm shift. So in traditional companies, in traditional organizations, the big boss is at the top and everybody works for him. In tech companies, or let's say in user-centric companies, you have to reverse the pyramid. So everybody should be focusing on the customers and the top management is expected to support, in fact, people lower in the hierarchy. So that's about facilitating employees, that's about coaching employees to help them to meet the needs of users, of the customers of this organization. When you do that, when you run a, a design thinking sprint, at the beginning you are lost. So you need to be aware that it's going to be very confusing because you don't know where you go. It can be even, let's say, um, some people can feel anxious about it because you have a, a white page and you don't, know, you don't know where you go. You don't know which solution you are going to, to find. So you just need to get used to that at the beginning to be lost and you have to trust, you will need to trust the process. The design thinking process will bring you to a solution, especially with iteration. And the iteration is one of the keys for design thinking. Without an iteration, you cannot succeed. And that's one of the main issues in organizations today to implement design thinking with our mindset, with a PMO, project management, uh, blah, blah, blah. So most of the time, we do not accept iteration. So with such a uh, mindset method, most of the time, in 20%, you can do 20% of what is needed, and sometimes it is enough. The trick is to do things quickly, so you can do multiple iterations very fast. That's the trick. So don't try to, 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 don't try to reach perfection because you will never reach it. So I love this statement, and done is better than perfect. I really try to apply it every day in my life and believe me it makes a big big difference whatever you do it's better to get something done than to try to do it perfectly because it takes you far too much time so apply it in your life and you will see it works very nicely so uh i love this guy he said something that is uh, uh very useful to me as well if you have one hour to solve a problem just spend, I would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem, so to define the problem, and the solution is going to come by itself. In five minutes, I get the solution. If a problem is well defined, the solution is easy to find. So those who are engineers, I think that's, that's obvious, and I think that's a very, very nice one as well. So in design thinking, most of the time, we don't try to do a Swiss knife. A Swiss knife, you have a lot, a lot of possibilities, but in fact, uh, none of them works uh, pretty well. So what we like doing in design thinking, that's a simple knife like that. One function, and it does it very well. So that's my uh, Opinel, a French uh, knife. I have it everywhere and I love it. It's very, very effective. And when I go trekking, that's the only knife I have maybe. So, about uh, practices. Practices, it is done as a team. Most of the time, you don't do it alone. You need to have this collective intelligence to bring more value to your customers. 
you do it so with what we call a design team. This design team, in fact, consists of multiple people coming from multiple multiple silos with different functions. They come from marketing, they come from customer support, from a production, from a supply chain, whatever. And uh, you you add some uh, specific roles like uh, user researchers, uh, UX designers if needed, brand strategists if needed. And all of them, what they have in common, they are design thinkers. So they know the method, they have a mindset, this user centricity, and they can work together to come up with a value proposition. So they come up with this value proposition in iteration. It takes multiple iterations to find the good one, meeting the needs of the users. So you end up with what we call a minimum viable product. So that's a concept. And if you have a digital uh, solution, in that case, you can take advantage of a UX development team with a UX designer, with a UI designer, in fact, to translate this value proposition into wireframes, mockups that are validated with users. So this minimum viable product at that time is ready to be produced by the Scrum team. So the Scrum team is going to produce it, an app, a web app, website, whatever. And over time, in iterations, you can add functionalities that are defined by the design team and by the UX design development team. So you can see that you have also iterations between those three teams. So you, so it was, uh, it was uh, when, I, when I came back to Paris uh, some years back, after 20 years abroad, I, I did a, uh, a workshop, one of my first workshops, it was 2015 in France, my first uh, design thinking workshop in France. Uh, and they, they, they sent me the pictures of uh, this picture of this room. And believe me, to run a design thinking workshop, sprint in this space, it doesn't fly. Yeah? So luckily they could find uh, another room, but you want something like that. So you don't need tables. You just need, in fact, uh, an empty space with plenty of uh, walls and windows to hang uh, canvases just to get the work done, just to work as a team with a lot of degrees of freedom in the room. So now the project, the design thinking project. So you have a PMO, so the project management office. You have a project leader. You have a project director. And then you do some planning or retro planning, and uh, you have deadlines. Fantastic, huh? No way. You cannot work like that anymore. So PMO is over in design thinking because, because you cannot have deadlines. You can have milestones, but no deadline because since you do iteration, you don't know when you're going to finish. You don't know when you're going to be capable to go to the next step to do the UX development or, or just to produce. So design sprint, the term sprint, is to say that this is design thinking in project mode. So the design thinking sprint, you do it with a design team, and this team autonomously is going to decide, in fact, what they do on the fly. So you cannot have a planning. You can just you can just have milestones and you can commit to the management line that you will report to them at every single milestone about what they did so far. And that's their decision to say if they go when they go to the next phase and when they iterate. We'll come back to that. So if you wish to know more about that, I have a, the, the website designguides.org. So uh, I'm writing a, a, a guide about uh, everything behind with artifacts, events, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it will be soon uh, available. So design thinking. So you can, uh, when, we come, when you come to our trainings, we have, a, we have a, a small booklet we give. So that's the Lean Design Doing. So that's a, a booklet of 40 or 50 pages uh, combining design thinking and uh, Lean Startup, and it says something about Business Model Canvas. 
in order to to show something more complete that you can use in many many different uh, uh, sprints projects for products and services or even more when you talk about uh, design thinking say so historically uh, two guys came up with it it was uh, Arnold from Stanford it was in 59 and you have Archer in 65 from uh, London so you see it's it's quite old it's not from the last uh, two decades it's much more so um, uh, later on Tim Brown and David Kelly in fact they they have been using extensively this human centric uh, approach for products and later for services and later for organizations and they did it with their uh, company that is uh, ideal so tim brown he has this uh, definition of a design thinking this is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people the possibilities of technology and the requirements for business success i love this definition and you can see that he's talking about an approach he's not talking about the method approach it's it's closer to mindset so that it's key as soon as you consider that as a method design thinking is dead it's a mindset the user centricity is at the source of design thinking so when when did it become let's say uh, uh, known it was in 2004 when uh, business week got an article about Tim Brown and David Kelly and their uh, innovation agency. As a partner at the time, uh, Reddit is the co founder of SAP, so he's quite rich. And uh, he thought, wow, that's exactly what I need for my company. Because my, co my customers complained about our software that is not so user friendly. And if, and if I succeed to get all my people, all my employees, becoming user-centric they are going to develop software new functionalities that are going to be much more user-friendly so what they did he got uh, 35 or 36 million dollars from his pocket and uh, he gave it to stanford to start the d school of stanford so that's how he started and uh, okay now more recently you got uh, plenty of uh, articles or even uh, entire magazines hbr started in 2008 if i'm not mistaken uh, and uh, as you know all the uh, uh, managing directors blah blah they do have this magazine on their desk they do not have always the time to read it but they can see the table of contents and design thinking came back many many times they thought oh, oh why Wow, so they did focus on it and they understood the power of it. So that's why you have more and more companies using design thinking nowadays, because, because that's a way to differentiate yourself from competition. And for the companies using such a mindset, so for the companies that are design centric or user centric, they're financial performance is much much better than the others and that's very very logical huh? so if your organization is user centric is customer centric automatically you will do things that are more meaningful for your customers and they will like you more and they will buy preferably your products and it will bring you more turnover and you will be capable to sell it let's say less cheap or more expensive than competition and it will increase your profit and it will enable you to use this profit to innovate again and to better meet your uh, uh, the needs of your users and so on and so forth so you can see that there is a kind of a positive uh, circle loop uh, by becoming more user-centric so uh, you can recognize here what uh, tim brown said so you have the desirability after that you have the feasibility 
technology and the viability business. So that's a very, very nice example. If you want to explain to someone what design thinking is, look at this one. Let's imagine that you uh, bring five people in a room and you say you have to design something for the user that is at the bottom right. So just find your way. So let's imagine that those guys have worked uh, independently. They would come up with five different solutions. Yeah. And none of them would meet the needs of the user. Now ask them to work together and to go and talk to the users to understand his or her needs. So step by step, prototype after prototype, they would come up with something that could look like what is at the bottom right. Just by understanding the, need, the needs of the user and by prototyping and testing. Design thinking, this is as simple as that and as difficult as that because you need to get people working together. You need people to interview the users, to gain empathy with users, and you need people to iterate, so to accept the fact that they fail. Interesting. Huh? So you have four key elements in uh, design thinking. You have uh, uh, users, of course. The users are in the center, almost. You have uh, a team, and the team, that's the most important. And you have an iterative process and you have uh, a space where we can work. So if you type a design thinking process in Google, you're going to find plenty of processes. All of them, they are more or less the same. They look like the same. They have in common most of the time those things. So you have a phase about research, user research, and you have a phase about design. So, or solution design or prototyping design. And for both phases, you have, in fact, divergence. So, at the beginning, you, you interview a lot of people to gather a lot of materials and you converge towards the need of those people. And again, you diverge to when you brainstorm to find solutions to meet those need, this need and you converge again. So if you look at uh, Stanford, they have something very, very simple, even uh, simpler than before. And uh, they even have a process with an uh, iteration loop. So basically, uh, we did something similar with the academy. We have uh, something that is, uh, let's say, using uh, a color code to indicate the critical steps. And observation is the most critical one. And we have the size of the balls, of the bubbles, to indicate the divergence and the convergence. And we have the iteration loop. And we have this key articulation uh, that is uh, before uh, producing, before developing the value proposition. So I think you got it. You have really two main steps. The first one that's about defining the problem. Defining the problem is, is highly critical. Remember this guy, Einstein, he said 50, 55 minutes to define the problem, five minutes to find the solution. So that, that is very, very important. And uh, basically, okay, you, that's an infography to show uh, the design thinking process in a different way. So uh, it has all, all the different steps and even more. So I will show you, I will show you uh, rather quickly the different steps with the associated tools. So now we have the first step that is understand. So what you do most of the time is to talk to the experts to understand what they are doing. So, uh, to understand the ecosystem you are you, you, you are in. So you have a challenge to solve and talking to the experts more likely will tell you a lot, will bring you a lot of information. And you can, for instance, map uh, the stakeholders in order to identify the people you would like to uh, focus on, to interview. 
So let's take the example of a blah blah car with, with uh, Frederic Mazzella, who is the founder. And uh, let's say, uh, let's say we he, he used he used design thinking, but without knowing it at the beginning, at, uh, at least. But let's say that uh, he would run a project. In fact, he would say, okay, in the center, we have a traveler. And uh, who is around the traveler? We have the car drivers, we have the buses, we have the planes, we have the trains, and we have a family, friends, application, and uh, whatever, whoever. Yeah? And uh, so what you have to do after that, you have to observe. You have to observe some of the stakeholders. So that's the, really the most important step of this process. And uh, you have three ways to do it. You can interview, you can watch, you can immerse yourself. And the, the, the end goal is to develop empathy with your users to better understand their needs. If you do not understand their needs, no need to brainstorm because you will brainstorm on send and you need to know the needs. You have three different ways to do it. And uh, okay, Lean Startup is not so far away from design thinking and Steve Blank is used to say, there are no facts in the building, so get the hell out and talk to customers. You should not stay behind your desk. You have to go and talk to your customers. That's the most important. And that's what we do. So it was in a train station, for instance, to better understand the needs of travelers. And uh, it was a project in Amsterdam to better understand the, the elderly people when biking. And it was, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to better understand also elderly people in the subway and to see what were the difficulties when they don't see so well. So who can be a source of inspiration? In fact, extreme users. So why extreme users? It's because they can help you to identify what is really needed because they are going to express their emotions much more than anything else, than anybody else, sorry. So after that, when you gathered a lot of observation, you are going to use two maps, the empathy map or the discovery map. Those maps, they are very simple. Huh? That's uh, what they say, the users, what they told you, what they do or what they told you they do. Yeah? And something that is more inferred, what you think they think or what you think they feel. So you can use also the discovery map. And here now we are back to uh, our uh, uh, case with a blah, blah car. So for instance, uh, this uh, founder, Frederic, he found out that many cars driving in the same direction than his car, there is nobody inside. Yeah, the driver. Yeah. And it was uh, at the time, it was uh, 2005 or six. He wanted to go to um, his parents in uh, a province in France and uh, he couldn't get any train ticket. So he thought, shit, I really would like to go to my parents and I cannot. So luckily, his sister could drive him. And he was in the car of his sister and he could see plenty of cars driving in the same direction without anyone. He thought, wow, that's weird, that. And that's how he came up with the idea of blah, blah, car. What he noticed as well is that, okay, uh, me, I, lo I love talking to people, but in public transport, it's a bit difficult. Huh? People can, are not always willing to listen to you or to talk with you. Yeah? Uh, when you want to travel last minute, it's rather difficult to travel cheap. Yeah? And uh, when, to, you, when you want to go to from one place to the other, most of the time you have to go via main cities, Paris in France, most of the time, and it takes you more time and plus more and blah, blah, blah. So he noticed a lot, a lot of things, including the fact that uh, okay, he was willing to pay a bit more attention to CO2. Yeah. So uh, after that, when you gather a lot of information, you are going to create a persona. And the persona, that's an archetype, the archetype of your user. That's what it is. So it's not one person in specific. It's more combination of people. 
So for instance, that you interviewed. So for instance, in that case, Mathilde, 31 years old, in fact, she wants to go somewhere. And uh, we can think about uh, a second persona who is not a traveler, but the car driver, Pierre. Okay, we could have reversed. Huh? It could be Pierre willing to find a driver and Mathilde being the driver. So you can do the user journey. How does it work for Mathilde? Willing to go somewhere. What are the different steps? That's what we call the user journey. We will not do it right now. Uh, it's not the purpose of this uh, uh, webinar. One, one thing that is very important, that's the concept of job to be done. So it comes from uh, Clayton Christensen, a Harvard professor. And if you think about it, whatever we use, we use it for a purpose. So we use stuff to do things for us. But just keep that in mind. We do use things for a job to be done. Even, even a Vuitton bag. So after that, you need to define, you need to define, in fact, the critical need. What is the critical need of your persona? The critical need of your persona, that's your point of view. You think your persona needs that. And in order to do it, in fact, you are going to anchor your point of view, your perception of a critical need in the insights you're going to gather. So for instance here, Mathilde, woman of Stratiwire, to travel from Lyon to La Rochelle cheaply. Cheaply is the most important for her, apparently. Yeah? Because it is tough to find a cheap, available, end-to-end -end way to travel. So when you know when you know what the need is, you can ideate. And based on this need, to find a cheap way to go from here to there. In fact, you can think about plenty of solutions. So the, the, the space of solution is fully open. So we do, okay, what, uh, what we know very well, huh? uh, a brainstorm. And this brainstorm, you do it in two steps. So the brainstorm itself to generate plenty of ideas so there is no judgment and that's divergence. And after that, you are going to select ideas. And only after that, so there is a strong border between both brainstorm, idea selection. And you don't, ju you don't judge either, you just select, you just choose some solutions, some ideas. And now you are going to converge by choosing. So you have plenty, uh, plenty of tools for that. You have plenty of uh, brainstorm techniques. So here, that's uh, the six ways to help your persona uh, based on uh, your point of view or how might we. So you can have uh, the crazy eight as well. So that's the same than this one, but you think we're crazy, but crazy uh, solutions. You can use also idea napkin to come up with uh, the best solutions for your, um, uh, for your, uh, user and after that you can select such uh, 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 among all those ideas among all those solutions and you can use a matrix and say uh, what is relevant more relevant uh, impact no impact or feasibility whatever and uh, it does help you to choose the one that seems to be the best one so after that you are going to prototype and uh, prototyping, in fact, it can be anything. It can be anything. So you see here on this uh, slide, it can just be Lego. It is done in 30 seconds and for uh, just a few euro. Or it can be a mock-up done on paper. You don't need to code to start with, you just do it on a piece of paper to see if yes or no it makes sense to everyone and you can uh, very quickly test it you can do a service scenario i will come back to that or just on a piece of paper you can draw something so 
iteration that's key also for prototyping. At the beginning, you do a very, very quick and cheap prototype. And the more you learn, the more you can spend time and money to develop your next prototypes. So uh, I love saying that a prototype, that's something that you're almost ashamed of. And you need to be capable to assess one critical hypothesis of your solution, one or more. You can have multiple prototypes to assess multiple hypotheses at the same time. I love service scenario. What is it? That's a kind of a small, uh, a kind of small um, uh, comic. It tells, it tells the story of your, um, uh, of your user and your solution. So here you see uh, that uh, you have a user at the beginning, he has uh, some issues and uh, you have a solution and uh, it's going to fix the issue and you have some benefits. So prototyping the idea. So that's done with a service scenario and you have to test it. And uh, to test it, that's very similar to the observation phase. You can quickly, in fact, show something to someone to get some feedback. And be aware that Thomas Edison he was used to say that I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. So don't be afraid to fail, because if you fail, you learn something. Ernest Hemingway, he was used to say that the first draft of anything is shit. So just keep that in mind when you do some prototyping. It's normal to fail, that's the way to learn. And the quicker you're going to fail, the closer you are to success. So just to prove, so with uh, our uh, learners or with our projects, our sprints, we bring people outside, we send them away, and they're going to test with users their ideas. It's very, very important. And after that, you have some uh, feedback map to share all the feedback you got within the team, what did work, what to improve, the questions, new ideas, and blah, blah, blah. And you iterate. You iterate till you find the solution. And iteration is difficult in organization. So just remember Dyson, 5,000 prototypes. Uh, Easy Brief Decathlon, it was seven, eight years of development before finding the proper uh, solution. Seven to eight years. And look at Blablacar. So it was in 2003, I made a mistake. 2003, he got the idea of a business. 2006 now. So that's the, the first business, uh, so-called commuto, so that he changed into covoiturage. And that's only in 2013 that really got a lot, a lot of people, 5 million. And 2021 now, he has 90 million members, 22 countries, 25 million travelers, and 1.6 million tons of CO2 saved per year. So the storytelling, storytelling is not testing. Storytelling was really to convince people that you have the best solution. You do it only when you validated with your users your value proposition. I remember uh, Steve Jobs, it was 2007, 2008 for the iPhone, it was brilliant. Check it on YouTube, it was very, very impressive. And you can do a three minutes uh, role play just to convince people about your your, your solution, and you are at the end of the design thinking process. You have a final pitch, and luckily you can implement if you convince people. The weak point is really in the articulation between design and production, because at that time you can throw the baby with the, that, with the water of a bathtub. So watch out, just make sure that you have an overlap of people between both teams. And that's what I say here. I remember, I remind you that you have multiple teams and the articulation between those teams is uh, highly critical. So when you have a digital solution, coding starts when the design team validates the value proposition and when the UX development team validates mockups with users. So that is very, very important. Far too much money is spent 
on developing, producing, digitally something, and 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 it's not good. So you have to redo it five months, six months, one year later, because it was not good. So design thinking is about user centricity. I guess you got it. And uh, it is a fantastic mean to accelerate this human-centered uh, transformation that we need it uh, urgently for the world of today in all the dimensions. And we do it by enabling others, by helping others to adopt this mindset and to use our method and tools.